Well, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, hopefully you can hear my voice uh, loud. I have a tendency to have the geek voice, very kind of very soft. So I have to do a little bit more effort. Uh, my, main, my name is Marco Morana. I'm um, SVP in Risk Control for Citi, a uh, great bank here, not that far from level 39. Uh, today I'm going to talk on behalf of uh, will say myself, and not because I didn't have authorization for CITI, it's because it takes usually six months from the compliance to approve. Besides, uh, besides being with CITI, I'm also in the board of directors of two startups, one in Boston, one in California, and will take also some time. So I figure most of my talks have been given this year. I put a nice disclaimer that I speak on behalf of myself. All the information actually I provide to you is part of my undertaking, my research, and my learning on everyday experience on the work I do. Uh, so it will be nothing confidential and nothing secret, of, but of, I hope there will be some lesson learned from you and give you some good insights. Um, about myself, I don't like to speak by myself, but um, Matteo Meucci told me that perhaps I should show <laughs> myself a little bit. Um, to be honest, uh, I have a long experience in security as a practitioner, security practitioner. I've been with CT uh, about five years uh, prior uh, with the current role where I manage architecture, uh, threat analysis, risk ana analysis for uh, very highly criti critical assets for the private bank. Prior uh, to this, I was a technology information security officer for the retail bank. The, the consumer bank back in the States. Prior to this, I've been doing a lot of very, very interesting things, uh, consulting and application, application security training. Um, I also have uh, a patent for the secure email uh, as mine. I'm also one of the developers, very likely, to develop the first intrusion detection system. So I have a little bit of perspective on what it takes to build products, but it's outdated. So here we have Monday Security later on that will actually give you a more fresh uh, technical insight about building secure products. Um, today we're going to talk, I mean, threats for the financial industry from the perspective of cyber threats. There are different uh, types, right? There are different type uh, of uh, threat actors, there are different type of uh, business inputs, uh, there are different type of uh, threat agents. Um, uh, we are going to focus on malware threats today and um, based upon uh, a lot of uh, information that we gather, but also a lot of information that we, um, we as, uh, as, uh, as myself being part of uh, City, the lesson learned, but also we as Mind the Security, since I'm also part of the company as a director. So we'll give a little bit of insight from their perspective, from a consulting perspective. So just to set the stage, I will actually show you a video. And this video is from the American Banker, which is, um, a site that I actually, uh, we don't have anything related to it about being endorsed in the American Banker website, but I usually find their videos interesting because they actually speak the language to the executive. And some, sometimes one of the challenges I have in my career is that sometimes the information is too technical. Penny, there's been this resurging risk uh, with malware crews really going after social media sites like Facebook and job seeking websites like careerbuilder.com in order to ensnare job applicants and social media users to kind of either fork over their bank customer information or kind of act as mules in these scams to move money. I mean, how can banks and, the, and specifically these security experts kind of get their arms around this thing? Uh, yeah, absolutely. You've done some great stories on this lately. and. Uh, as you say, it's a very hard problem for banks. They do not have control over Facebook or Job Builder or, or any other uh, career builder or um, other sites of that nature. Um, one thing that they can use is a newer class of software that Gartner calls clientless malware detection, where uh, they don't have to distribute cl uh, software to their customers computers, they can simply be looking at the incoming transactions and they can detect certain signs of things like HTML injection or phishing and start to detect uh, some of the transactions that are coming out of these um, 
you know, malware generated uh, exploits. And I mean, as we've kind of written a lot about, biometrics could go a long way to ensure that the person who's making that transaction is actually the person who has the credit card, right? I mean, that could be another way to kind of hedge against these type of attacks. Exactly, yeah, and, and we've spoken to ING Direct and um, a number of other banks that are piloting uh, facial recognition and fingerprint recognition. A newer one we're seeing some startups offer is um, uh, behavioral um, biometrics so that they're measuring keystrokes or measuring mouse movements to um, to see your pattern. So you've got a certain way that you type, certain way that you move the mouse mm -hmm. that nobody else can exactly mimic because you're yeah. special. Yeah. And so uh, they can pick up on, you know, this is not the person who signed up for this account. This is somebody else. So, you know, that's a big one. So, so again, banks are, are certainly vulnerable in kind of this new emerging online world, but they're certainly not helpless. Yeah, absolutely. So we are certainly not appless, and uh, I, th I find this story very interesting because there are, in a way, it touches a little bit of uh, what Mind the Security has actually been developing for three years, a technology that uh, detects malware infection in a way that is agent-less or client-less, based upon a very simple JavaScript uh, to detect web inject. And um, Giorgio Fedon, the uh, chief operation officer of Mind Security, will actually explain you a little bit more what is behind the detecting web inject. Other points in the video are very important, just briefly. The attribution problem, so really understand what the source code is, uh, the IP address, or the having a, a bioprint fingerprint of an authenticator maybe is tied to the, the identity of the user. Uh, the other aspect is um, fraud detection, behavioral analysis. That's a lot of work being done now in data mining, understanding the behavior that is trusted uh, by the one that is not trusted. So um, when things happen, usually um, where you have an incident, where you have an attack, typically you start from the end. So basically you've been compromised. Uh, uh, you have maybe an instance of fraud or an instance of security incident. And you have a group of people that assemble together to get their head around or actually to understand what the causes of the, uh, of the attack are. So just for example, the first que one of the questions I may answer in the group is uh, what are the tools and techniques that the uh, fraudsters, attackers use in this, uh, in this security incident? Another one would be in terms of who are the threat agents behind, what's the attribution problem they actually mentioned in the video, and how you actually can identify who is behind this malware, who is the threat agent, is it uh, a cybercrime group, organized group, or is it individual activists? Uh, which type of uh, data the attackers go after? Is it confidential data, sensitive data, credit card data? or as something like your intellectual property in a company. So that's very important. Um, which type of exploits of vulnerability are used in order to deliver the payload for attacking the target, but also to exploit directly the target? So there's an aspect of vulnerability exploit is also important to, to actually tie to the threat agent. Um, but you, the question you always, in a, in a, in a security incident response team, uh, they are going to answer, to, 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 to ask, and they want an answer for, is what is going to be the potential level of this assert based upon the potential business impact? Is it going to impact the franchise? How spread is is? Is that just one application, or is a portfolio of application? Like in city, we have 5,000. Uh, let's say websites they do just for the private bank. How many of these are actually highly critical? Maybe N4 or even 4N4, right? So that's the next question that happens is what's going to happen to the other ones that potentially fit that profile of risk? Um, and then is what we do about it. How we stop it? What's the root cause? Uh, how we can prevent uh, that to happen again once we actually fix the problem? So the other aspect is situational awareness. So after this incident is taken care of, um, basically cover and you just stop it, you maybe you just find the, the source of the attacker, of the attack, and then you figure out that you have to disable some password and disable some accounts, and, and you start over again, you fix the vulnerability, you start over again. The next aspect is, what's the lesson learned? 
from this. How we make sure that we are all aware of the risk now? Because mostly the risk is going to be up to the senior management at that point, because someone in executive management has to make a decision. At, at that point, made a decision what to do with that, right? So situational awareness, absolutely critical. And it starts by understanding how the malware uh, take place in terms of uh, who is the first avenue for compromise. The first avenue of compromise, unfortunately, there are two things. One is social engineering, phishing, because the, the human firewall is the weakest uh, chain in the uh, weakest element in the chain, but also drive-by download. The drive-by download means basically the fact that you're actually browsing today a site that potentially be the vehicle or infecting your PC and you don't know about it. just the fact you have flash enabled, you're actually watching a video. You don't know about it, that you're from that point on, the next step you do a bank transfer or logging your bank account, you've been already compromised by the fact you've been infected. So that's very critical to understand. These are very subtle attack vectors. The other aspect is we are not dealing with uh, yeah, isolated hackers. I used to be working for NASA in 1997, and uh, NASA was the target in the US mostly by uh, hackers that were hacking for fame, to be famous, and spread the viruses. They have no money movement or money motivation behind it. Uh, so their motivation was to become famous and have their virus spread. So now we are dealing with cybercrime. We are dealing with people building and selling cybercrime tools. So it's a very different game. Uh, the money movements are the primary target for banking Trojans, and we'll talk about that later. we we'll talk about also which data they're going after. They go after all the personal data of customer, credit card data, debit card data. They bypass mostly all the traditional technology, and we'll show about what I mean traditional technology from a security standpoint, multi-factor authentication, for example. So the attack is built to bypass the traditional security control. So that brings us a challenge to build security controls that are resilient to these type of attacks. The majority of the incidents, like the incident you actually show in the previous slides, are not found by the primary target. And this is based upon Verizon data breach data. They are found by third parties. And they're also found weeks or months after the first instance of the attack took place. Which basically, for me, tells me perhaps we should do better in detection, in analysis, uh, in fraud detection as well. The type of fraud can be pursued by uh, malware attacks, can be ACH wire transfer, so basically manipulating a transaction to transfer money out of the bank accounts. Or it can be money laundering, because why? Because the money goes to a money mule, and the money mule is an authentic account that can actually be used to launder money from proceeding of. Once you have an uh, account takeover of the victim, you're basically possessing the account. And that money goes to, to a money mule, so it's completely hidden from uh, the traditional whitelist AML. Identity theft, uh, counterfeiting, uh, counterfeit a card is basically all these attacks are actually blended. That what you do with the data, you either sell on the card in black side, underground economy, to sell the proceeds of your data, but also you can actually counterfeit credit cards. It's much easier to do actually in the States than here. Uh, because here we have chip and pin, it actually makes it a little bit more difficult. But the procedure on this data is actually to fake a credit card, counterfeit a credit card or a debit card, and then take money out instantaneously for 35 branches in New York, like happened last year, for a procedure on $20 million. Um, I mentioned the current and present fraud is basically with the data, we actually do payments. And if you have all the data sets that are required for do cardinal present purchases, uh, you probably do. Application fraud, which doesn't mean fraud against the application, means you have the data to apply for a bank account. So you basically have a form of identity theft uh, impersonation to open an account uh, and do an account takeover uh, that way. So the challenge today is really, now we know the threat, we know the risks, 
is that what we do about it and how we defend, how we protect our castle. So this is a picture from um, Kruger Day, uh, which is used to be the um, the mint designer artist for the Queen, for for the for the British Empire. Uh, this picture is like 1927. I take this picture because also I cover a book I'm publishing, but to me is emblematic of the status of the defenses today, which basically they're always bypassed by attack. They're actually smarter, so you don't have more. You basically lost control of the perimeter. You lost control of protecting the access door. Doesn't prevent someone to bypass and get into the wall or get in from the insider. So we are not at the shift of the gunpowder yet, which basically will be the shift goes to the power to the attacker 100%, and you have the small 10% to detect this coming. Maybe I don't know, uh, but we are very close. So that's why. I see that's kind of the picture of the status of the things today. So we need a new approach. And the approach I'm advocating is let's understand the environment. Let's understand what, where are the threats today. So the first part, what I'm showing here are the threat security domains. The larger one is the unknown threats. Well, we don't know that one day we're going to face as uh, security manager to protect our company from. Um, you can learn from these emerging threats, the one they're actually preparing today to attack you tomorrow, by doing cyber threat intelligence. But also you can learn from your security incidents to enact measures and risk frameworks and new policies and controls that can become pericolated to the company to protect from. Um, the next step is to take the lesson from threat intelligence, the building of, from threat intelligence you can build your threat library, you can build your knowledge base of attacks, and from those you build a process to do what? To engineer, because that's, that's my perspective, but from us, the people perspective may be engineer a new policy with a new risk framework, and this new risk framework is dictated, is dictated by the threat that you're facing today, not the threat of five years ago. So that's, that's the challenge. What we do today, most of bank, or I would say the industry today, we focus on this orange area. So basically, we completely blinded to threat. We do compliance audit, we check for security controls and policies, and we do application vulnerability assessment. Why application? Because here we're talking about mostly application security, but you can think about penetration tests of your network as well. So you can see the domain you're securing is very limited compared to what they actually you should be doing to really be effective. Uh, one example of compliance, there's a lot of information here. But you probably, if you're a security manager, you know you have to manage your assets. You need to know where your assets are, the value of your assets, your data, your functionality, high risk functionality in an application, understand uh, is this a highly critical asset for my company. So you always have asset management, you have a risk profile. Here you have the risk profile, for example, for an online bank application. It has a description, has contains sensitive information. What I would like to focus here is the compliance drive, because most of banks focus on compliance, of course. There are a few examples of, for example, compliance for PCI, GLBA, uh, or the information security standards. <laughs> so the drive for security, just looking at compliance, is you, you basically making sure that covers all the aspects of compliance, all the regulations, regulatory mandates. And I'll give you an example from a FIC perspective, Federal uh, Institution Examination Council, which is basically the OCC in the States, the Office of Control and Accuracy, mandated in 2006 all the banks to have multi-factor authentication. So what was in effect required, and many banks did, was to implement multi-factor authentication. Why? Not because it was required, but because they said that it was single authentication was not sufficient to protect the online banking customer. And the requirement was to do a risk management, to do a risk analysis, to understand the risk. But by saying so, the interpretation was to implement multi-factor authentication. Most of the banks in 2006 implemented authentication multi-factor. 
two types of risk transactions, such as assessing confidential data of a customer, or such as doing a high risk transaction, such as a money movement transaction or white transfer. Among, not within one institution, but between one institution and another institution. So that translates into security requirements. So my team that does mostly uh, risk analysis and advises basically the chief information officer and their problem and problem manager and developer, uh, technical developer leads was to implement security requirements across the board to implement a, a multi-factor authentication. So from that perspective, the challenge of this has been, and I'll be sure that later, that that's today in 2011 and today, this is not enough anymore. So basically we are five years, seven years later, uh, six years later, we actually revised completely, seven years later we completely revised the FFIC mandated some controls to be obsolete. Uh, and I will show why they consider those obsolete. You could have done your threat analysis exercise, threat modeling, you could actually identify this controller actually obsolete. Back to the orange part, the other aspect after compliance, which can be done by a consultant to do checkboxing, or if you want to do some more due diligence, you actually make the value out of compliance, is to do vulnerability assessment. Uh, here is where my head is mostly familiar. Why? Because I'm passionate about security, so I devoted a lot of my free time as a volunteer for the Open Web Application Security Project, which is a no-profit organization international. And all of us, we come out with the idea of the top 10 vulnerabilities, the most common vulnerabilities. We took 650 common uh, vulnerability exposure. From my time, we say from these 650, these are the most 10 critical vulnerabilities. So you need to test sites today for those vulnerabilities if, for example, you want to be PCI compliance. PCI compliance actually mandate and describe the OVASP, which for me is like a badge of pride, OVASP as an organization that you have to refer to in order to be compliant with PCI for application security. The type of assessment, you can do it from a black box perspective, which is the left hand side, or you can do it from under the cover. So under the cover, you usually look at the source code. You look at uh, flows in the design and flows in the way the code the bug uh, that potentially be exploited for like a coding error can be potentially exploited for, by, uh, by an attacker for attacking the, the asset, the application. So this is nothing new. What is really <laughs> new today is that we, we don't talk anymore about vulnerabilities anymore, or we talk a little bit still, but we mostly talk about what? Threats. So you, talk, you, you hear every day about uh, threat intelligence, you hear every day about threat-driven security. Uh, so it almost like becomes like a jargon for selling products. If you mention threat, you're not going to sell your new tool. Um, so I try to make my, my mind around threat analysis, and I figure what, which type of threat analysis really matter for application security. So at OVAS, we developed this guide for CISO, application security guide for CISO, which are more than welcome, it's free for you to read it. And the reason why this guide was written was to address the problem of communication, to explaining uh, to executive management the value of application security and the threats of application security. So we started understanding the concept of vulnerability attacks and motives and try to basically make sure that it's not just the fixing across a scripting or a SQL injection that is important, but understanding who is behind the exploit of that vulnerability. But also who is behind from the perspective of understanding the motives of the attacker. Is that an activist probably is going to do this with a denial of service attacks or defacing, or maybe even stealing your password to show to the world to embarrass you. But if it's organized crime and it's going for money, probably it's going to use for financial reasons. Uh, so you have different type of attack vectors. You have banking trojans. You have crimeware. So, so that count is very critical to put in. Today, this count is actually baked in um, Mitre Corporation as a new language for threat dissemination called STIX, Threat Information Exchange, which basically allows basically to have the common view language of threats, and has a field called threat target. A threat target is a vulnerability. So you can think about vulnerability today as a threat target. So I was 
explaining before about the compliance is always a few years behind the threat. And here I'm showing an attack that could be learned in 2006 against multi-factor authentication. Specifically, um, here, this type of methodology um, that you can see on the left-hand side, you have a normal user authenticating to a site, entering username passwords, and then entering the extra credentials. It can, can be in a form of a challenge question based upon a risk score, or it can be based upon a token, or based upon digital certificates, or based upon OTPs. So the attackers engineer solutions to defeat these controls. As they're actually coming out in 2006, there were attacks against IP spoofing, for example, IP geolocation, was the primary indicator to set a challenge question trigger to determine the risk score of the client. So the IP address was actually spoofed by putting proxy in the middle, which really didn't matter, because in the same geolocation of the trusted source. So that control was bypassed. The other controls about machine tagging from a perspective of entering data like as, as the challenge question in the sites were actually compromised by what? By keylogger, which basically meant that everything that you enter in your PC was going to amend in the middle under the control of the attacker. So why? Because the, the endpoint client was actually compromised and everything was entered, including the challenge question or the OTP was compromised through man in the middle uh, to, the, to, the, to the froster. So basically capturing the challenge question in transif. Uh, interesting, they were kind of catching uh, cat and mouse games during these uh, attacks. Like for example, Sunbanks came out with the virtualized keyboard because you know, the thinking was, if I have a keyboard compromised keylogger, I do a virtualized keyboard, then it's not going to be compromised. Wrong. Why? Because they have a frame grabber. So they grab the image, and they knew exactly what was you were actually typing. So that's, that's bringing the point about engineering solution for security. How? Well, think about a car as, as airbags today. Most of the security technology today, unfortunately, I'm sorry being on a negative side here, but this is not my statement from other experts, is that today most of applications are built at cars without airbags. They are not built for being resilient to attacks. So in order to build for resilience, you have to basically have that thinking. So interesting enough, in 2011, addendum of FIC, they retire our challenge question KBA because it was basically guessed by social engineering on Google. Uh, they retired the RSA Psyche. Also, RSA Psyche was actually an anti phishing control from Bank of America. It was basically ineffective for anti phishing that were retired. And required to do what? Adopt out of bound authentication. So, so the assumption is you are compromised. Your channel is compromised. The only your safe bet is that you are interacting to a channel that is not compromised, such as mobile, to end to end, not just receiving an SMS OTP and put it back on the side, but you know, having basically two way authentication for transaction authorization. Also, on the fraud detection side, suspicious activity detection, which is basically deployment on ARC side, deployment on security inside the monitoring. So basically understanding the behavior trusted versus not trusted, based upon the log analysis and so forth. So in terms of <coughs> malware tracks and attacking techniques, really the, the, the attackers today have an arsenal of opportunities to attack your bank, and they can attack by hacking directly, or they can attack through misuse of a use a case of the application, like I mentioned before, as shown before with the abuse cases, they can do physical attacks. So that's the fact that you keep, keep your computer, not, you leave your computer unattended, or you leave your phone unattended, become a possession of the device, which is the authenticator. Of course, social engineering and malware, of course, has different avenues, a different type of uh, attacks that are actually embedded as attack vector in the malware itself. Um, security in this DLC. That's the next step. So yes, you understood where the controls are effective. And now you can do a gap analysis, let's say, right? So I have control a different layer from the client and the server. But how I do engineer a solution, a product, assuming that a bank actually develops their own product 
for example, Citi does. And five years ago, the chief information security officer of Citi, Joseph Byron, told me, Mark, you know that we have more developers than Microsoft in Citi? We are a software company. So if we are a bank, but in reality, we are a software company. So then we started Security and SDLC. This is a program that I badge my honor for me because now it's used by the whole corporation. Every product developed, the follow, even the waterfall life cycle or the agile, has mandate, threat analysis, threat modeling, has mandate of uh, risk-based testing, static code analysis as well. So different stages of the life cycle, you have different assessment. The objective of this is, that when you arrive here in validation, you don't have surprises, or maybe 50% of surprises. And the other advantage of this, by doing this earlier, is much more cost effective to mitigate them later. Because think about patching 5,000 applications or building them with security built in from the beginning, it would, cost, it would be much cheaper to fix and to maintain. So it's also a return of investment. From a perspective of uh, understanding the malware, you really need to look at the attack vectors for different stream of malware. What is the challenge with this? The challenge is that today I have a stream of malware infection and tomorrow I have another one. So an antivirus system that does initial detection, I'm probably you, you already know this, is basically completely ineffective. So to be effective in, in the analysis of malware, we really need to look at from the type of malware, understanding the type of attack that the malware has embedded into it, which type of attack vector. You're talking about men in the browser, which is completely outside the control of the bank, because basically it's web inject on the browser to get data that goes directly to the attacker, such as extra PI, extra credit card data. It can be keystroke login, it can be men in the middle, bypassing MFA, Certificate theft, everything can be compromised on the client, including the digital certificate on your HSM can also be compromised. So basically, this, this helps you out. It helps you because you have to make those assumptions. When you do this risk analysis, you make your assumption that the client is compromised. And so what I can do on the back end to pretend that money transaction not to go out in the bank is really to implement the additional security controls. So, but you can start detecting when your malware is actually acting from the compromised machine. So maybe you cannot protect 100% of the front door, but maybe you have a hint that someone is doing reconnaissance against you, or maybe your behavior on the browser is not really someone that is actually acting as a user, but maybe it's a script. So it's an automation behind it. So and then Giorgio uh, Fedon will talk about more about these aspects, how important having a tool to actually detect that type of attack vectors. And here towards the end, uh, <laughs> these are kind of, I tend to be, I'm Italian, so I like to cook and I like to put recipes around for friends to share and, and then we get some uh, uh, exchanges of information about, you know, this is my best recipe, you try the spices, oh, well, I didn't try that because it comes from Tuscany and then it's much better than from my own countryside in Northeast Italy. So then Tuscan, Giorgio from, um, Stefano Di Paola from Tuscan always wins because it's got the best recipes. Anyway, so let's, let's try that to Tuscan. Uh, <coughs> Tuscany. So, and this, uh, these three points are, from my point of view, uh, essential, you can use it from your uh, recipe for you actually starting learning, uh, building a strategy, risk management strategy against, against malware. Um, you can use Garner layers of fraud detection as well. Whatever you may, at the end you are now with three groups and the first one is you have to fix the browser vulnerabilities, you have to fix the front end, detect those vulnerabilities on the browser, uh, adopt security in SDLC, the second part is by learning from the attack and the attacking methods and techniques and processes, which is actually a term part of six now TDPs. Uh, you learn how to build engineer solution, countermeasures to protect from those. And protection is detection. It is also protection for uh, mitigating the threat from compromise. So it's, it's detection and encryption is uh, learning from the attack vector to detect the attack vector as a specific vulnerability to exploit and then fix the vulnerability that potentially be exploited. Um, Anti-malware tools on the front end, strong authentication, 
And I don't want to cover here what really strong authentication means, but basically authentication is effective against this type of malware attacks. Fraud detection, of course. There's a lot of effort today in the industry, a lot of startups almost a part of it, those, um, like Comfort Technologies, where they actually, their uh, action is really to do data mining, understanding what really the behavior uh, tax is. And so it, uh, Digital Shadows today, for example, one of the companies here on Level 39 has a very strong um, technology around this as well. Uh, so I think data mining, behavior analysis, understanding the attack vectors from a perspective of behavior is very critical. It's very important to cover that aspect. Um, to do a risk analysis is your initial step. And once you understand the risk, once you uh, document a risk framework, so you basically you have to basically create a new process, identify your critical assets, and assuming that those critical assets are compliance, yes, but compliance is not enough. How, how their risk profile is against this type of threats. So basically reviewing the compliance mandates, yes, you can leverage compliance, Compliance is awesome. It can be leveraged to do more. And what you need to do more is really to do specific type of tests for the controls you don't have, or adopt specific countermeasures, like we have a specific DDoS attacks, application layer DDoS attacks. So we probably want to talk to one of the companies that protect uh, a lot of uh, banks in that frame and understand you know, how they actually protect uh, from this type of threats. Um, that's it. At this point, I have just one slide. Uh, this is more a quiz. I don't know if you know what's the gentleman on the right hand side here, on the left hand side. Because I will give you a free book. <laughs> because that gentleman is going to write the foreword of my new book on, uh, on application trend modeling. And just to give you a little bit of uh, the funny side, sorry, it's going to ask Obama what's your favorite book to read, which is obviously not mine. <laughs> and his answer would be, well, Ernest Hemingway, the for whom the wealth tolls is one of my, of the books that mostly inspire me. So with that, I'm open for discussion. Uh, any questions you may have? I don't know if I have five minutes or so. Uh, so I'll be happy to answer. Yes, sorry. Quick question. Yes. You mentioned uh, the, thank you. Uh, uh, Mike Loganoff from Hewlett Packard. Um, hi. You, you mentioned, hi. Hi, I'm Mark. Uh, that you're more a software company. Uh, yeah. A large part of, uh, of your business is developing software. Um, and building in security into the software as you build it and security yeah. by, by design and all that sort of stuff, clearly the way to go. I'm just wondering how you're finding um, taking that approach forward and the culture of doing that, I'm sure, in agile environments and these sort of things. How well is it working for you? Uh, moving forward the program, uh, operationalize the program, yes, absolutely, it's very critical. So the question is, uh, yeah, banks are software companies, and security and SDLC is the answer, but then how you make it happen? And it's a challenge to make it happen. Because basically you don't own the problem 100%. You have to basically partner with people that they do development, the engineers, the technical directors. So you have to understand their perspective. And you become partner with them to build a secure solution. So uh, obviously operationalize across the board is important. Piloting the solution first, understand what the roadblocks are. But there's also maturity that is not the same across the organization. So doing a maturity model assessment first, because some organizations will be more mature on development and others may be lagging behind because they have a lot of outsourcing. So they're not very mature on training software security, on performing testing of software security, or even designing a software, a secure software application for the, for the banking side. So yeah, certainly those are just all comprehensive and you have to basically uh, embed all of them. Yes? I have three minutes, so for other questions, you can also do any question. <coughs> yeah. Hi, so James Hi. Chappell, Digital Hi, James. Chinese. Hi. <laughs> By the so, way, Digital Shadows is one of the level 39 companies here, and uh, you know, very pleased to be mentoring a little bit the Digital Shadows here as part of my level 39. Thanks for inviting Price. us today. Yeah. Um, yes. My question is, uh, we've got endpoints which are often you know, managed by people you don't know. Yeah. Uh, they're using software provided by third parties that you don't control. 
Yeah. What, what, what can you do to influence those third parties? For example, the makers of uh, you know, Mozilla who are going to make Firefox or Microsoft who look after Internet Explorer. What, how, is there any way that you can work with those parties to improve the situation? Yeah, absolutely. Good point, and uh, thanks for the question because uh, you know we had Arbly recently, and you know, open source vulnerability that was so critical. And uh, you're dealing with open source, we're dealing with a uh, community developing uh, tools and then maintaining those tools. And who's maintaining vulnerabilities for those? I, I actually convinced them that it's critical to do so. Um, I don't have one answer to be honest. Maybe the answer is first, knowing the problem yourself, do an inventory of any open source library you have and how much of these open source libraries can be a critical asset to take care of in your case. If you already have OpenSSL, you probably know you have already this have been very highly critical. And then work out through the community, through the open source providers that they actually provide that solution, they maintain that solution for you to make sure that you have all the updated patches. Basically, FOSS and production vulnerabilities, from my point of view, should be treated the same. But one is more challenging because you don't have a point of contact. You have a group of point of contacts. So I'm sorry I gave you James the most knowledgeable answer, but that's my best bet. <laughs> yes? Gentlemen on the end, last row. Hi, uh, very Hi. interesting. Uh, so yes. far, my name is Adam Wilson from Swift. Um, Hi. I've seen. Oh, your partner was, right? So I want to talk good about you, of course, in Swift. <laughs> as long as so you guys do all the, all the risk payments for us, right? Yeah, so um, I've, I've seen quite a lot of uh, interesting innovation around um, end user security devices, yes. um, use of PKI and biometrics. I'm yeah. wondering on your perspective about the trends of these externalized devices to identify the individual. I, I do yeah. like the ideas of tracking behavior and all that kind of stuff, but how yes. does that go hand in hand with yes. you know, thank identity, if you like? And, uh, Adam. Adam, thank you very much for that. So the question was, there's been a lot of talk about authentication devices, basing your phone authenticating in an online transaction or for doing payments, for example, and which are the most effective or the more, the, 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 the ones that the security industry is looking at as being the solution. And so, <laughs> I mean, here I have a little bit of head on Knock Knock Labs because basically I'm uh, one of the technical advisors of this company where uh, in business in California, Palo Alto, where the mantra of the company is basically we get rid of passwords. Basically, your phone, your embedded identity uh, is uh, embedded in your chip and they are the front end authenticator to do payments. Uh, some they don't see in that way, some they see being a digital certificate, some they see it by from the perspective of having chip card and um, HSM, uh, digital PKI like you mentioned, but PKI protected on the client on in a secure element which is protected up to a certain level because as you know secure elements can be also being compromised with your broken devices. So this is a, my answer, I don't have the answer honestly. I think this is an evolution you can see, I probably see it from a Swift perspective, how important it is to trust the source more than a password, and even more than traditional controls. So digital identities for sure, but how you protect those digital identities is very critical. So now there are standards from NIST, for example, for digital identity. There, is, there are two movements. One is the NSTIC in the States for digital identities in the cyberspace. Uh, there's one in the UK, I believe, as well. So basically having a common way to look at identities and have the infrastructure that per allow to enable stronger authentication also for payments that's critical. Okay, I think I've I think I lost I've got my three minutes, so one one more time. One more question perhaps. Yes, the gentleman you're in the front. <coughs> that I see on this, particularly on, around the identity space, is actually getting the, the economics right. 
And there have been so many yes. assumptions. It, it's, th these things we can solve, but so long as someone else pays. <laughs> that, that, that one has been one, one of the real challenges. Yes. Look, look, looking after identities, the, the, the banks can issue very strong credentials, in, uh, in, and they do with the credit cards. Yes. But, but they, 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 they don't glue together and work with everything else. Um, Who's pay for the problem? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, limited liability is fifty pound, fifty dollars for yeah. your credit cards and instead. So I've worked for one bank. <laughs> banks I've, pay for it. Yeah, I work for one bank. Another bank probably won't, won't trust my credentials, so they don't have any control in that matter. Though actually, they're equivalent in strength. Um, how, how do we actually? <laughs> move yeah, Andrew, I think you touched the point of uh, kind of um, pain. Let's say right. And well, 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 I have a simple answer: is security is not absolute, but also security is not always a technical control. And sometimes it's a legal control. It's an SLA that you have. Uh, term of condition with your customer once you log in, they always take responsibility on the desk. So banks usually don't because they don't own the device. So their liability transfer can also go to the cloud at the moment that the cloud actually takes your data to do transaction for you. So you're making sure who is going to pay for it is not going to pay for the for the breach, but it's going to pay for all the other things like you know legal lawsuits and fraud or cross border issues. So so who's going to pay or really depends on case by case from my point of view. But actually putting in the right recognition. Uh, if, if we have a transaction which is done on fake credentials and it loses five pounds, people are, the banks are probably not going to worry too much on those. Absolutely, ones. attribution uh, is the attribution but, is but, the what we are challenging. But, but we do tend to design systems that make everything up to the, the, the highest level that we're prepared to put it up to, and we have all these complicated login processes. And no, absolutely, we, I agree we, with we you. We've got it wrong somewhere. Yes, and that's why I think. My belief is a stronger engineering solution. Thinking that way, that's just one of the answer, not always the answer, but one of the answers. All right, so I thank you very much for your time. Thanks. <clears throat>